Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. The big question for this week is a two-parter, I guess, in that uh, it's uh, of the of these four aspects of being a musician, which is your favorite and which you like least. Um, I meant to say like, <clears throat> you know, these four, but if you think of something else, which I did, but I'll just say, you know, these four. Uh, songwriting, practicing, recording and touring. Um, so uh, for my uh, least favorite aspect, um, I chose recording because uh, I actually, you know, it's weird. I enjoy, I do enjoy being in the studio. Um, I just, uh, I get this weird, I get, I don't know. I it's It's, it's like the equivalent of stage fright, but in the studio, but mm. not like visibly, you guys probably have never been able to tell, but I just, I can't, I can't stand committing something to tape or whatever, like as this is like the baseline for this song, you know? Cause like when we play it live, sometimes I'll do it like a little bit different here and there. Um, and then sometimes I'm like, and I don't know, Dean, you and I are always like, always, feel like we're done pretty quickly like what we have to do which is cool but then sometimes there's a lot of like sitting and waiting not because you guys are taking your time but mixing which is another thing ah uh, see i don't want to go on too long because like i can't stand mixing either <laughs> <laughs> but uh i you know, i'm just being honest because um i don't know i just i always prefer the live thing more what practicing i like doing that too um but my favorite is touring, although it's a lot different when I have, you know, having kids, but we tour in a different way than I toured before I had kids. So that's also kind of a cool thing. But you get to visit your children in each city that we go to. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's yeah, I mean, joke. I, it's not true. It's a joke. And I give them a plus one. So sometimes they bring their kids. <laughs> they come in. <laughs> they bring Matt Gates with them. I've seen, I've seen your, your one daughter. She's for her 15th birthday, strolled in with Matt Gates. <laughs> I just, what? I love touring because I really love, I just love, and I'm not just saying this because we haven't, I haven't played a show in a year and a half, but I just really love playing live so much. Um, I get no, I, I seriously get no anxiety playing live. And so many people I talk to, like even people who have been doing it for years are like, really? Because I still get it. I'm like, none. But then when I'm in the studio, I get like, I get like, ah, I get weird about, and I get weird when I'm on camera too. Like I, and I used to like acting and on stage and then people were like, oh, you should do like on film. And like, I would always get frustrated because I was clam up like on the camera. I don't know. Maybe I'm secretly Amish and I feel like it captures my soul. And... You were good in those low budget videos. Yeah, I was really drunk for most of those. Oh, I didn't know. Nudity was, was tasteful no. too. I thought that was, <laughs> I mean, thought that was called that. for in the script. <laughs> So yeah, that's my, those are my answers. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, I guess you, you, you considered touring to, to have the uh, live performance or playing shows aspect of it or whatever. Yeah. Like you said, it was only four of probably many things about being a band, right? So uh, interestingly, uh, I, one of the things I like most about being a musician is the recording. I love that aspect of it. Um, I love the recording and songwriting. Um, I, and, and as you mentioned too, I, I like the touring now, you know, um, more than when we used to tour back in the day because I don't think I could ride around in a van for six weeks at a time anymore. It's just not gonna happen. <laughs> so, you know, the kind of touring that we do now is, is a lot of fun to just, you know, get away for three days, go to a, a city, or three and um, you know play some fun shows and then come home and then you're done with it you're not on the road for six weeks um, uh, you know I guess the least thing um, although it's it's not uh, uh, terrible but of your four I would put practicing at the low end of the thing you know it's necessary but 
the other things are more fun for me. Recording would be the top probably, um, which is probably why I have a, a room full of crap here that I <laughs> record songs with. So that, that would be uh, my answer. I, I, I don't, uh, I don't particularly get state like quote unquote stage fright in in a recording studio. Although I do see what you mean by having to commit to the performance, so it's just a matter of getting comfortable with what the performance turns out to be. Or even like on the spot, being like, ah, there was a mistake. Fuck it, we'll leave it. And then every single time for the rest <laughs> of my life, I hear it. Yes. It's like the Telltale Heart. Yes. Boom 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 boom. Um, I, I can get a little bit of stage fright occasionally when performing. I don't know what triggers it, but it usually goes away after the first song. So oh, the ghosts. <laughs> yeah. Ghosts. A lot of theaters are haunted and you know you're like you're you're playing and you're looking over and there's this melted yeah. <laughs> I just I hate when that happens. Yeah. So anyway, th this that's my answer. I I've never had any I I've never it's weird, I've never had a moment of stage fright. It's just People are like, don't you give, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't know why that is other than the fact that I am, of course, clinically insane and a <laughs> sociopath. So I probably don't have regular human emotions. All right, let's start. Uh, first, it wasn't on the list, remixing. God, uh, remixing is my favorite thing on earth. Um, people send you, that, and this is two types of remixing, folks, if you're not familiar with it. One is where a guy says, yes, I boosted the DB on the kick drum by, you know, by two on in the chorus. And like, oh, okay. No one can hear that. And then there's remixing where somebody sends you all their stems of their songs. And it's like, you know, they're like, do with it whatever you want. And I'm going to trust you. It's like somebody giving you their baby and saying, all right, take it down to the nuclear power plant, mutate it, and let's just see what happens. So I really enjoy the hell out of that. Sometimes you find yourself like I am in now where you remix a really big project and um, you're not allowed to talk about it for months and months and months. So I'm sitting, oh, I'm sitting on something and um, it's got to hatch soon. Uh, also, um, sometimes on a remix, not only do you like the bands that ask you to remix, but the uh, um, people you're remixing with are you're just blown away. And that gives a great line. Again, we mentioned Stephen Archer, where I said to Stephen, oh, this is some pretty stiff competition. And Stephen said, don't think of this competition. Think of it as a contest, a contest in which your work will be judged and perhaps prizes awarded. So I always thought that's the way I look at it going in. Zug from Angel Spit uh, said a remix is a night fight between you and the track. So when I went into remixing, I basically apprenticed for a couple of years. And I went and I, I learned how to do that. It's one of the things, one of the rare things I'm actually good at. And I really do enjoy. Uh, after that would be songwriting. Um, every, I uh, have a noisy head in case people can't tell. And it's just crammed with songs. So like my house is covered with bits of paper with like little things scribbled on them. And you guys have seen my handwriting. It's like a child. So I, the other day I picked one up and said, grandpa's not a racist, but he voted for one. And I thought, oh, so it's like that has to become a song. So every Sunday, um, I have a thing, again, Zoo from Angel Spit came up that idea called Church, where I sit down and I dump ideas from my head out and I kind of work out the music for them. You're not allowed to have social media, but this is as close as I ever come to meditating. And I think it's very, very good for me. When we weren't together for 16 years, I didn't write songs. And I was like, there are a lot of, a lot of missing families in the Midwest. I just, I, you get really angry and you bottle it up. So that um, is basically songwriting, I think is the, one of the best things you can do. It's, I don't have children and it's like, I go into the studio and I give birth to something, which is again, a disgusting thought. And then a couple of years later, it starts dating Matt Gates. Hi, oh, <laughs> but, um, the, uh, up next would be recording. Um, I think of recording the way Orson Welles thought of a music of, of a movie studio. He said, it's the biggest set of trains that you're allowed to play with. And I think I used to be nervous in the recording studio. I would bump into something and have to pay for it. I don't care anymore. Um, also, I discovered one day, lean in folks, because this is interesting. There's no right or wrong way to record something. Did you know that? There's no, there's no right or wrong way. There are rules like the 1212 rule for recording an acoustic guitar. You know, that's fine if you know that rule, that's great. You can do, get, the, get a take, and then I did it, a friend of mine, she was uh, wanted to record something. Uh, this is before the, the pandemic. Recorded her using the rule. That was great. But then went back and just decided to experiment with it. An idea I stole from Ken Marshall, by the way. Still a lot of great ideas from Ken Marshall. When we get back in the studio, I want to try the trick of, on, on the second verse of a song, 
just put a little delay on the snare drum. It makes it, it kind of makes it so the verses are a little bit different, keeps people's interest going. These are the things I, I just really want to try. I think that um, a studio is, is a great chance. You work on the song, you get it down, you practice it, you know, get it right. You go into the studio and this is your chance to, this is where you want to experiment. This is where you can get, you know, a little weird and say, okay, let's try this reverb. Let's try that. So I think that's the great thing about studios and people let you do it. And I always feel really at home. When we were at Joe's Garage, you know, uh, uh, go to the butcher's studio. I had an incredible time. I felt at home. I felt really good. So yeah, I, I would recommend going to the studio. But anyway, just, just break into one. Up next is rehearsal, not practice, rehearsal. Practice is what you fucking do at home, people. Um, if you don't practice at home, don't come to rehearsal. Um, are you guys free? I don't practice at home, and I come to every rehearsal. It was <laughs> great. I enjoy that. I enjoy seeing everybody. I enjoy going out to Bucks. That's fantastic. Are you laughing at the Bucks thing? I'm freezing no. up here, so I can't tell what's, what I'm missing. Oh, um, you, you, it was just a quip that uh, Dan said we might just cut it out later. Oh, here. Before you see it when you watch it back. Yeah, you'll see it. Oh, okay. Uh, up next on that list of things, uh, right before touring would be scrubbing the toilets at Rikers Island. <laughs> I don't like touring. I don't. I love you guys. You're like brothers to me. I do not like touring. You're probably the only reason I tour. Uh, you guys make me laugh on tour. Dan has made me laugh harder. One, I, and I remember exactly what it was. I had to go do an interview. And I said, Dan, while I'm away, you're in charge of sarcasm. He said, oh, am I? And for some reason, like, you know, it's a real laugh for me if I cackle like a hyena. Um, so that was that. Was that. I, uh, um, I'm not a big fan of, the only thing I like now is get to pick the opening acts, uh, which is good. And I only pick the opening acts because some promoters were just horrible at it. Uh, and there were some great moments in there when we had a Rose Garden funeral party open. There was a little girl who um, was strumming along like air guitar. And her father was like, do you, do you want a guitar? She's like, yeah, He's like, I'll get you one. Like, those are the moments I love. Um, I love when we had, um, oh, when we had Gentleman Junkie uh, uh, on the bill with us in LA. And the guitar player with Gentleman Junkie was the guitar player um, from Kevorky and Death Cycle. I was like, holy shit. I'm like, I'm grabbing the guy next to me. I'm like, it's the, it's the guitar player from Kevorky and Death Cycle. And he's going, Descendants? I'm like, no, no, not Descendants. Kevorky and Death, oh, fuck it. So, um, yeah, so that's what I like. Um, I, like I say, I don't, the, the promoters will often choose bad bands. And that's because they get all their info from Pitchfork. And they, I, like, I often know better bands in a town than the promoter that's something i don't like i hate stage divers you know people hug your children give your children love so that they don't jump up on stage in the middle of our show pretending it's 1983 going look at me daddy love me daddy love me pool <laughs> membership so they, they learn how to die yeah, pool membership pool. anything it's not 1986 1986 wasn't a great year to begin with um so yeah just you know, I, you know and and they're going to kick they're either going to kick joe's pedals kick the mic into joe hit my keyboards no i don't like that at all i don't like i'm um i'm a very type a person and music is not filled with type A people. It's filled with type B people, as in type hepatitis B. So like I have, I'm so sure stuff's gonna go wrong that I have like triple redundancy for everything. That's how I worry about every show. So I have like three, you know, if I, if I, need, if I need two uh, audio cables to do a show, there are six in my bag. If I need uh, uh, like three USB cables, or one USB cable, there are three in there. I just, I, I worry about this stuff all the time. I'm wrapped way too tight for music. Um, and, you, should, uh, um, you, should feel, and, you should you should feel comfortable being able to go back and forth across the stage without worrying that the keyboards can get knocked over. Yeah, well, yeah I, I should, there's a lot of things I should feel believe comfortable about. Believe it or not, about, I've been able, to, never I've been able to stop people before, believe it or not. I've been able yeah. to get there and kind of like, uh, while playing it, you know, Song. Remember when we were playing in, I think, Portland, and the guy with the camera started wandering around on stage, and folks, Dave is our manager. Dave had to pick him up and walk him off the stage, and we were just losing. Yeah, it's, it, or it's, you get people backstage, you're not sure who they are. It's mm -hmm. somebody's friend of a friend of a friend of somebody's third cousin who starts opening your beer, doesn't ask, and starts pounding them down, starts, like, eating the food. Um, we had a, everything you're complaining about about touring is like yeah. stuff that I like about it. <laughs> so that's that's why I'm never I'm never backstage. I'm usually out front watching the bands. I usually wind up like pissing in the 
the public men's room and people are like, you know, you got a bathroom back there. I'm like, yeah, but there's some guy back That's there. <laughs> yeah. I've never met before. You know, some guy I'm Rodney's nephew. I know what my nephews fucking look like. You're not my nephew. So yeah. Um, you know, and the thing is people understand if you see me, I work hard. I, I I'm in, uh, it's my job. When I'm on stage, I'm doing my job and you paid money to see me and, or see us. And I'm going to make sure that you're going to get your damn money's worth. Cause I know, you know, tickets are expensive. Another thing I don't care about or don't like. Uh, and uh, um, I know you folks work hard to come see us. And I will, you know, I'll, I'll break my back to give you the best show possible. But I'm just saying, like, you know, I, I there's there's a lot of stuff that goes along with it. I'm not crazy about it. Well, I, I actually put touring at the very top of my likes. <laughs> this is, and, yeah, folks, you're getting the idea of the dynamic of the band. <laughs> <laughs> and I even like to go on solo tours. I get anxious about it beforehand, but as soon as I leave the house, I'm fine. And I don't really like driving that much, but I'll still do it. I'll, I'll take all the bad because the good is worth it. I love performing night after night in a different city. I like meeting people. Um, I like seeing stuff. I like being on the road. <laughs> uh, just funny because when we started touring way back in 1985, I think you were initially reluctant to go on tour, weren't you? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't like. There was a period of time when I didn't want to go on tour. Well, some states he's not allowed in. Right there. <laughs> also, seeing stuff is the biggest description. I didn't want to leave <laughs> home. Come on, he's seen. We've all seen the thing. We've still, all seen the thing. Yeah, we've all seen the, th even the those, thing. Is in your even hand. those tours, I even that okay. those tours I didn't want to go on. I had a great, I had great times, and I had great fun. I had fond memories of all of them, and I hope to go on tours again. Um, but I think a lot, some of that aspect is because I like performing, so I'll take the perform performing out. Touring with the Dead Milkman, I would say, is a lot easier than touring on my own or with other bands I've toured with because the Dead Milkmen have usually have a tour manager that takes care of a lot of things that I would have to deal with on my own otherwise. But still, I like touring. Um, second on my list is recording. I love recording. I've loved it from when I started doing it before there was a real Dead Milkman to the present day. And I never had I never have anxiety in the studio. Partially because I you can always do something again up until you, I mean you run out of time, but for some reason it just never occurs to me that <laughs> that's gonna be fixed in time for everyone else to hear. I don't have I don't, you know, whatever. If I if I don't like that recording, I don't have to listen to it. Other people might want to listen. I mean, that's up to them. But I like, I like the aspect of recording so much that I think that songwriting comes after that. I think I write songs just so I have something to record. <laughs> in fact, I think that's the way I did it in the past is like what I love my four track. And so I worked at it. I was like, well, I need something to record. Let me just whip something up and start working on that. And then the process of recording evolves the song in a way. I like experimenting at my on my home at on my home studio. I like like Roddy says, learning new ways to mic things is always it's actually fun. It might be geeky, but it's fun for me. And then practicing. I don't dislike practicing um, or rehearsing. I like the social aspect of it. Um, probably on if I I would put even below that practicing by myself, but I do it because. If I didn't, then the recordings wouldn't be very good if I didn't practice and get something in the way. And, and a lot of my home recording is practicing because there's no, there's no timer. Oh, you're looking at the studio. The, drum, the drums back there. Yeah, it's just I, do, I, can, I can do something for 67 takes in a day and lo and behold, I'm practicing because I'm getting better at it. I'm doing it over and over again and honing it. But and you only get to, to hear the, the sixth, off. seventh, so, yeah, yeah. you don't hit to have to hear all the other stuff. So yeah, I would do touring, recording, songwriting, practicing. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Um, <clears throat> question. Good question. Good question. Good. Excellent. Oh, yeah, question. I wanted to. I wanted One to say. Favorites. 
one last thing about it is uh as far as recording being my least favorite thing <clears throat> that's with the band with bands i guess like in the studio <clears throat> that whole being being nervous about putting it on a record or whatever but i have like thousands and thousands of songs i've been recording since i was 18 mostly instrumental stuff some of it i put up on bandcamp and some of it i i do it and i've been doing it consistently uh, without missing like a month or something for for like 25 years it's it's crazy it's like compulsively i do it so it is i i love recording and i love making songs it's just i don't know there's something about like like committing that final baseline to it or whatever or like um or just what what if one day you just suddenly like oh make the song sound like this like how we took the the lydia song and it was in um Lots like three time. four time and mm -hmm. then we changed it like you can completely like a song can be a completely different thing if you just did one different thing or made it a different like use a different instrument here so that's why i freak out in the studio i'm like ah we have right. to narrow it down to be this one thing you know and then it's like mm. but like rodney you brought up a really good point remixing i didn't i didn't i'm glad you mentioned that as an extra thing for the thing because that's like a great because i love doing that too it that's got cool. me through it got me through the uh, um through the covid period because first of all i don't like to leave the house anyway but <laughs> people would sit were sending me remix after remix and I was I was completely book solid with working on them, and I love it. I, I'll sleep under the the console and just like wake up and go, well, let me try this or that. And uh, what I do with the remix is I say, when do you need it? And they say, well, give it to me in th in three weeks. I'll have it. I try to have it ready in two weeks because in that way I don't overthink it. With uh, one thing I've learned from remixing is a song isn't finished when there's no more to add. It's finished when there's no more to take away. Hmm. But the, I would suggest for you to feel more comfortable in the studio. Think of it as your home. Like you've been in the studio with me and you see, I don't wear pants in the studio. <laughs> don't wear pants at home. Look at this. <laughs> hey now, hey now. So, well, for recommendations, um, I, I would recommend, and it's not, I don't know what the brand is. I don't know anything. It doesn't matter, but it's this new style apparently of like small blanket, like a throw blanket. And it's just the, freaking softest thing I've ever felt in my damn life and I don't know how to explain it other than just you can watch my face enjoy how soft it is you got to get a soft blanket um also uh the show I can't I don't know if it was on I can't remember if it was Netflix or not but it was about Scientology uh Leah Remini is the host and it's like this really long oh, like three yeah. seasons um I was like, there's no way I'm going to watch all three seasons of it. And I pretty much did. Pretty much. I probably missed a couple here and there. But if you have any curiosity, anyone about Scientology, one way or the other, watch this show and just take what you want out of it. But it's very informative from people who were, who were heavily involved for a long time, uh, exposing a lot of scary stuff about it. Um, so those are my recommendations. Uh, I'm going to recommend two YouTube videos. Uh, one is about a half an hour long. I guess you could call it a mini documentary. It's by a YouTube guy named Bo Miles. He's an Australian dude. Um, he's got a lot of followers. I guess he's been doing it for a few years. He is an, a, an adventurer, but he's like a college professor type dude. I don't know what he teaches exactly. Um, but he has a video out called The Commute, Walking 90 Kilometers to Work. And it's an interesting little half hour video about, he lives in the countryside and he, and he works at a university near Melbourne, Australia. And normally he would drive to work every day uh, to teach or whatever. Um, about four years ago, he, he walked to work as an experiment and it was a very interesting uh, experience. And then recently, I guess his department head or somebody at the college asked him to give a lecture to, to the students um, about his adventurism type lifestyle and, and this, that, and the other. And so he's decided to shoot a documentary of him doing that same walk, walking to work. Um, he sets out from his house with just a hat and a sh uh, shirt and pants and shoes. And uh, it takes him two days to get to work. And he, 
he um, he finds you know he finds money on the street and he uses that to buy food. Um, about halfway through the day, he'll start looking for like cast off blankets and things to sleep at night. Um, he he'll even pick up like half drunk soda bottles and stuff, making sure it's not piss, but he'll drink it. Um, he even found like a half eaten banana and he'll eat the rest of the banana and stuff like that. Um, but all the while he's, he's uh, offering some interesting thoughts and insights about, you know, commuting and driving in your car to work for hours at a time versus actually taking your time to observe what you're driving past. So I, it's called um, the commute walking 90 kilometers to work. I'll, We'll provide the link below. And the other video is shorter and a little more lighthearted. In fact, Dan, maybe your kids have already seen, maybe you've already seen this one. It's um, the Lego chocolate cake time-lapse video. Are you familiar with that one? Your kids do a lot of time-lapse video stuff, right? This is pretty incredible. It's yes. basically um, making a layer cake out of Legos via time-lapse. It's pretty, pretty wild. Oh, wow. Yeah, it must have taken a long time to make. So you you can also watch that. So it's okay. called Lego Chocolate Cake. Lego in real life. Stop motion cooking. <laughs> so somebody who lives in Australia, an entire continent populated by poisonous snakes, poisonous <laughs> spiders, crocodiles, and backpack murderers decided, I'm going to walk to work. Good for you, buddy. I'm going to sleep outside naked tonight. <laughs> Actually, South Philly, that happens a lot. Um, I wanted to use this time to recommend the new Youth Code album, which is called A Skeleton Key and the Doors of Depression. It's fantastic. Only I don't have time to do that because the two-legged talking turd, Brian Kemp, the guy who calls himself the governor of Georgia, the man who sits in this woman's chair, which rightfully belongs to her, decided that he would come up with Jim Crow Part two, uh, they passed the law, I guess you folks know, they passed laws in Georgia uh, restricting voting hours, restricting where they could put drop boxes, times. Um, this is the law you probably heard about not giving, you're being allowed to give water to people waiting in line. I've known people in Georgia that waited eight hours in line to vote. Um, this, is, this is just an attempt to disenfranchise people. It's terrible and you can actually do something to stop it. Uh, what you can do is I want you to call both of your senators. You should have both of your senators' names on your phone like I do. Um, if you don't, you hate America. You failed that test, but here's a retest for you. Put both their names on the phone. I know a lot of people are like, oh, my senators don't listen to me. You would be surprised what a 30-second call can do. Trust me. All right, call them. Tell them you want them to su please support S1, the For the People Act, and also the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act. Please tell them that. Um, both these laws would actually... Uh, through um, basic redistricting would take care of the problems that we're seeing, uh, the a sort of right-wing push in Georgia, uh, the push to disenfranchise uh, people of color. And, don't, and a lot of people think, look, I'm not a, a black person living in Georgia. These laws are coming for you. These laws have already gone to Texas. They're coming to Pennsylvania. These laws are coming for you. The other thing I would like you to do is I would like you to go to fairfight.com uh, and donate. Oftentimes I tell people donate if you can. You people have got 20 bucks to donate. There's some bullshit you're buying. If you look behind me, you know what's not there? What's not there is a Korg Minilog XD. I'd like to have one. Instead, I've got two senators in Georgia. That's where my money went, and I'm happier with that. And they make the same noises as the Minilog XD. So they'll be on the next album. So I just, just want to bring that up. You can do this, okay? Make two calls. You can make them make pause right now. Pause the video right now, call your senators, tell them to support, particularly support S1, the For the People Act. All right, ready? Go, and we'll hold to you, we'll come back. All right, thank you. You did your job as an American. Thank you. Our grandparents had to go fight the Nazis. All you had to do was make two 30-second calls. I'd like to recommend a video called Wendy Carlos demonstrates her Moog synthesizer in 1970. Those are the cats? And it was from the BBC archives, but it's on YouTube on this channel called Soup. I'm not sure. Do you know? I don't know. I don't know the soup thing, but I just found it. <laughs> There's a Wendy Carlos video where she has her two Siamese cats are everywhere on her shoulder, but it's the first instance, it's the first filmed instance of cats crawling on synthesizers, which if you own any keyboard instrument is a thing that happens constantly. And this is actually the very first where somebody captured 
two Siamese cats are crawling all over the sense. I think that one's called Wendy Carlos Interview 1989 BBC. And that I yield is, to my colleague. <laughs> just looking at it right now on YouTube because I have I have Wendy <laughs> Carlos uh, as a filter on my YouTube uh, <laughs> YouTube uh, things, and that's right up there. I see the cats. Which, hello, huh. hey Cujo, oh, hey Cujo. <laughs> I'm looking hound. And Stephen King really once the budget fell down. Oh. Ah, Cujo, Cujo. Here we go. This is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm gonna call my senators. All right, bye. Bye, bye folks. <laughs>